Russia is like such a disruptor, a lot more brazen in many ways uh, than Beijing. So looking at how China's um, reaction to the war has been very muted, definitely not uh, supporting the invasion kind of isn't surprising to me because um, I kind of understand how that's not exactly the way a Beijing would like to operate to get more influence. It kind of wants to work um, within institutions as well as to use its economic clout uh, to get that power. Mm -hmm. This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I am with an extraordinary journalist and author today whose book I find just what you might call different in a beautiful way. China Unbound, A New World Disorder by Joanna Chu, who works as a journalist with the Toronto Star and has an awful lot of what you might call personal history related to China, residing in Canada, observing all over the world. And uh, I was really spellbound as I looked at this book. And given all of the fragileness in global political economy and geopolitics, I've tried to make, uh, how would I say, an effort to illuminate this, but it's sometimes hard to find a very bright light, but today I think we have one. Joanna, thanks for joining me. Oh, wow, thank you so much, Rob. <laughs> that introduction was, like, you know, so flattering, and, you know, it makes me feel you know, to get this invitation from you in itself, like made me feel like a sense of relief. I was worried about how the book would go over with American audiences because it is very critical of the West. It's critical of U.S. leadership uh, on mm -hmm. foreign policy making and uh, rhetoric around China. Um, and my book doesn't provide very simple answers. Um, it's you know hard to sum up in talking points. So you know, really honored and glad well, that you enjoyed. What I the would book. say is tough love is still love. And sometimes cowardice is not love. So I think you're bringing some very constructive mm -hmm. things to the table. And uh, before we really delve into the bits and pieces, let's talk a little bit about your background with an eye towards what inspired you to write mm -hmm. this book. And so what what, what is your, mm -hmm. what you'll call generative experiences in life that brought you to this beachhead where you felt compelled to create this offering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt, um, you know, growing up in Canada, I was born in Hong Kong, um, but my parents uh, were one of the, you know, a large waves of people who left Hong Kong, basically fled the city after the Tiananmen uh, 89 massacre of um, pro-reform demonstrators uh, in Beijing. Um, that really spooked, obviously, a lot of Hong Kongers who were set to return uh, to Chinese sovereignty in 97. Um, so I think it was a kind of a case of reverse psychology where my parents made the sacrifice of leaving their hometowns of Hong Kong and settling in Vancouver um, so that, you know, me and my brother would have kind of enjoy this kind of life in a free society. But, you know, as soon as I was old enough to read about what was happening in China, Chinese society, I just felt this huge um pull uh, to learn more, to live in China, um, to understand, you know, what led to that point. Um, this kind of Western fascination that's always been there about China, I wanted to be on the ground and see what, what, was, what extent things were accurate and true, and to kind of also use my, you know, interest and passion in writing and reporting to bridge uh, some of the understanding gaps between people in the West, uh, people in China. Um, so, you know, I went to school in uh, journalism in New York. I got my first uh, job at a South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, which was great because it is a Hong Kong-based newspaper that's in English. So I was able to start my career writing for a mix of both local Hong Konger, Chinese, and international audiences, which is a space I've always wanted to be in. Um, I think people who know China best are the people who live there, who are Chinese. Um, and it was great to start my career engaging with these people and in, in the sense writing for locals as well. Um, and then I ended up in Beijing from 2014 to uh, late 2018 um, and returned to Canada. Uh, like I said before, when we were chatting, thinking the China story was behind me because I had spent, you know, seven years reporting on the ground, 
uh, for, you know, major European uh, American outlets. Um, but as soon as I returned to Canada, I realized the China story was global. The stories I did, um, especially in the latter parts of my time, um, that were very kind of sobering uh, to do with human rights. Um, I met with so many human rights lawyers, uh, advocates, professors, people who weren't actually political at all who ended up uh, in jail um, being seen as dissidents in uh, Xi Jinping's China becoming more and more authoritarian. That was part of the reason I think I think my mental health just couldn't keep up with how tough it was. Um, sources I knew, so many just ending up uh, in jail or silence in some way. Um, so, but back in Canada, um, December 2018, uh, the Huawei executive, Meng Wanzhou, was arrested in Vancouver airport. And weeks later, uh, Beijing took really obviously as hostages two Canadian men, Michael Kovrig, a former diplomat on leave, and Michael Spavor, a businessman, hostage because they were so angry and wanted uh, Canada to release Meng. Um, so that really shattered my you know illusion that china's story could be contained in china it was definitely a global story not just a global story involving clashes with the u.s as a superpower but involving um, tensions and confrontations increasingly with all sorts of countries um, so the book um, uses that on the ground flavor um, drawing from my reporting in china to, uh, to try to um, help people understand china's political system and kind of growing afford authoritarianism from the inside again using those authentic chinese voices and also reporting from several western countries i use as case studies across europe north america and australia um, places like turkey and russia as well um, to give those cross-country on-the-ground experiences and comparisons so people can get a understanding of where we are right now and how we got here, how we got to this point where it seems like people have woken up overnight to the realization that things with China could be headed in a pretty tense um, direction. Um, and people, ordinary people, like those two Canadians, the two men who were taken hostage um, because of these tensions, could be affected. Um, before, when I was writing about China for um, everyday reporting on the biggest news in China, you know, a lot of the stories wouldn't be front page. I worked for major news wires like AFP, where any publication, New York Times, LA Times, could could grab it and, you know, promote it and print it. Um, but China stories often weren't always, you know, front of the newspaper, um, you know front of the website, um, especially when it came to issues like how Chinese citizens were suffering. Um, but, you know, in the last couple of years, last few years, I got so many questions from just ordinary people who suddenly felt that the China story was relevant to them. Um, things like worried moms with, you know, sons teaching English in China saying, oh, should he be worried? Should my son leave China? Um, so I wanted to write this book for, for anyone who really wanted to get a grasp of how things got to the point of these tensions and to form their own informed opinions um, because the flip side is that I've seen a lot of dangerous misinformation coming from the West, coming mm -hmm. from US uh, senior politicians, coming from Trump. Um, that isn't probably the most productive uh, trend to emerge from this uh, increased uh, public hmm. interest in China. I know I've seen, uh, being in New York City, some uh, acts of violence in and around the subways against Asian mm -hmm. people since this, these tensions have risen. And uh, there's a yeah. great deal of, uh, I guess what I will call, uh, you have people in America, the famous uh, economists and Case and uh, Angus Deaton talk about the diseases of despair. And when Donald Trump came into town, ran for president, he kept talking about how the system was rigged. And a whole lot of people, particularly people who work with their hands more than in, in mental activity, uh, had been displaced. And they, in essence, didn't blame the American government for not making what I'll call transformation assistance with globalization and automation. They demonize the Chinese as though they were the cause. And Donald Trump fed that quite actively. Mm -hmm. 
and I saw yeah. a great deal of hostility. It reminded me of books I had read about the time, say, during World War II, where Asian people were put essentially in what I'll call country club prisons. And I don't mean they had golf mm -hmm. courses. I mean, they were just taken out of society for fear that they were spying. There's a, a paranoia. There's an anxiety. I mean, we experienced yeah. a lot of the distress related to racism in this country between black and white or black, white, Hispanic. But the Asian population really has come under pressure. I wonder if, you know, you're being in Canada and so forth after these two people were apprehended. Did you experience any hostility or uh, episodes on the street, anything mm -hmm. yourself? Yeah, so I was afraid of both for myself and my, you know, older parents even taking mm -hmm. public transit, uh, walking down the street. Um, myself, uh, I was such a, you know, a hermit, partly both fear of catching COVID mm. and and um, being a victim of hate crimes that I personally didn't experience it in the last few years. But, you know, it's been brewing. Um, I've been harassed, um, really uh, threatened uh, on the street, both and online um, for years before mm -hmm. COVID hit. Um, it's more that the tensions with uh, the Chinese government, plus the outbreak of the disease coming from Wuhan in China, um, kind of put some of these um, deep strands of racism and xenophobia uh, all over the West um, to just like more obvious proportions. People felt more um, kind of empowered to say things, to even physically assault people. I did speak with people who were physically assaulted, who were punched in the face. Um, you know, I reported on an elderly gentleman in Vancouver, 93 years old, with dementia, um, being pushed to the ground by someone who was huge, like a middle-aged man, um, saying, um, you're to blame for COVID, basically. And a lot of this, I think, it was heading in that direction already. Um, I feel, you know, living in China and, you know, knowing the people I knew, including who are in positions of privileged people like lawyers, people like professors who were struggling to try to give even the mildest criticism to their government um, feedback, um, you know, working on things like trying to reduce corruption in the system. There's a, a lot of complexity there. There's people who want to, you know, improve things, who see how the system is broken there. Um, but a lot of the times when people think of China, it's as if Chinese people are also, in a way, blamed for what their government is doing, even though that's not very sensical because China is not a democracy. Yeah. <laughs> the leaders aren't being mm -hmm. um, elected. Um, in fact, people who do try to provide that feedback, try to work with the government to make some changes, people like feminists who are trying to work on things that are not political, trying to um, spread uh, uh, distribute stickers against sexual harassment on public transport. You know, they're the kind of people who have been arrested, who have been targeted, um, who are kind of forced to flee the country. But in the public discourse around the world, people don't know those stories. People just see kind of a blank, um, almost like this army of robots, automatons, people who support the Chinese government, you know, people who work in factories, producing cheap mm -hmm. goods as if they're to blame when, um, you know, China, for China's, uh, you know, economic power. Um, so a lot of lack of sympathy for the human condition of what it is like to be living in China, all the complexity, and not even taking into, of course, not even taking into um, consideration how the Chinese government is also not a monolith. Uh, it's very clear that a lot of people in the government uh, that I know and have spoken with feel worried about speaking out and um, kind of standing out because uh, President Xi, since he came to power, um, has really you know taken so many political purges. It's a environment of just a lot of so much self censorship and fear mm -hmm. in China right now, and that is made worse by the publics around the world uh, responding not with sympathy and curiosity about what is happening, but lashing out, um, 
really simplifying and equating uh, Chinese people with mm -hmm. the Chinese government mm -hmm. and Chinese leadership. And it's not, you know, the average Joe and Jane, and it's people like, you know, yeah. officials, uh, Trump um, encouraging this. Um, I've kind of tracked how this plays out. Um, you know, it really kind of becomes more prominent bef during the election campaigns, um, both. And it's and it hasn't gotten away uh, under <laughs> Biden. Biden's administration also came in trying to almost out hawk uh, Trump on China. Um, Biden has continued this really simplistic um, rhetoric of how America is fighting kind of this ideological battle uh, as a leader of democratic nations against authoritarian nations, um, you know, naming China. Um, it's this clash between uh, democracy and autocracy. And, you know, as a result, um, it's hard to make really nuanced policy making in this, in this environment. And when it kind of gets mixed up when this rhetoric is very popular in many cases with the domestic public, I think a lot of the, the point of saying things like that is really not to engage with um, Chinese leaders, but to send a message of strength um, and kind of solidarity with uh, domestic mm -hmm. audiences. Yeah, I think uh, I recently had a conversation with the gentleman from Singapore, Kishore Mabubani, and he writes a column for the Straits Times. He just issued a book called 21st Century Asia. One of the chapters called mm -hmm. Democracy or Plutocracy. And what he was talking about was what's the comparative model between the U.S. and China, and what do other countries have the opportunity to you know, be inspired by or emulate? And he talked about the scale of prison uh, incarceration as a percentage of total population in the United States and other things that essentially, and, and I think this was the last phrase, I read your book last weekend, but I think in your chapter on the United States, you finished with the phrase, you got to practice what you preach. And uh, I think that uh, that's an old Barry White song, but uh, I do think you, uh, you really hit the nail on the head that us polarizing, us being aggressive, us, which am I called, demonizing China, probably frightens people within China and makes them more susceptible to what you might call succumbing to authoritarian leadership. Uh, yeah, and so, so I, I, I just see a, what you might call an unhealthy dynamic on both sides escalating. Mm -hmm. And I will be very, you know, how would I say people will take sides or whatever who might watch or listen to this podcast. You were fiercely critical of both the government in China mm -hmm. and in the United States. This isn't like you're mm -hmm. involved in a team sport as a propagandist. You're really trying yeah. to illuminate a very unhealthy dynamic and all of its feedback loops. And, exactly. and... Yeah. And I think that comes from being a Canadian and also being an immigrant to Canada where I kind of occupy a space where honestly, I'm not really patriotic to, to any country. Um, I kind of have a sense of where I'm kind of on the outside of wherever I'm living. Um, when I lived in Hong Kong, even though I was born there, people kind of heard my kind of outsider accent when I try to speak Cantonese. Uh, when I was in China, you know, speaking Mandarin again, um, an outsider uh, in Canada facing that racism and xenophobia because to Canadians, um, the mainstream white Canadians, I look Chinese. I look like not a Canadian. Um, so I think that kind of position is actually healthy. And a lot of people are like myself where, you know, we are critical of all parties involved and, you know, try to provide constructive criticism. Um, Instead, I think of when, especially in the U.S. Um, and increasingly in Canada and Australia, when, you know, there's a talk of kind of an outside um, threat, uh, which is, you know, a lot of times China these days, you know, before the war in Ukraine started, um, a lot of these places, the main foe um, for them was a rising China. And... It's complicated because you mentioned, does this push people in China away from engaging with the West, makes them more likely to support their government? Um, it's an interesting question because um, along with that, when there are people 
like um, I spoke with an intelligence officer, Amy Chang, uh, for an essay updating on, you know, arguing that these problems haven't gone away under Biden. She said that her security clearance took a while because they suspected, you know, the loyalties of her parents. Um, she had to provide so much documentation. And when she was on the job working as a, you know, U.S. intelligence officer, she fielded constant jokes that she was a communist, that she was a Chinese spy. And, you know, she's one of the lucky ones because I spoke with many other people who weren't able to work for the U.S. government or, you know, U.S. intelligence services because of their ethnicity or because their parents or their grandparents <laughs> had immigrated originally from China. Um, so the people who have, you know, this kind of insider outsider perspective, who understand uh, China deeply, who may have spent time there, who speak the language fluently, um, they're not being able to really easily um, rise to positions of influence uh, in in the public in the West in in policy making. And instead, you know, we have people like Newt Gingrich <laughs> writing books, Steve Bannon um, talking about China, you know, starting these organizations um, that have uh, just so it's just riddled with misinformation um, about China. Some things are just made up. Uh, in Bannon's case, I was very critical. Um, he actually made a movie where he used a character based mm, on I myself, saw that. Mm -hmm. and it included all sorts of falsehoods. <laughs> um, so I think it is so dysfunctional that in the West, where we do have the freedom of press, we have freedom of information, that we use these freedoms badly by not really elevating the people who understand China, instead shunning them, treating them with suspicion, and elevating often the people who have just really um, compelling, but in in many cases, false uh, statements on China um, to, you know, elevating them in public discourse. It is dysfunctional because I do, you know, I have checked in with friends in China and it's not as if they're so easily swayed, like, uh, okay, now I'm going to support uh, the, the CCP where before I was trying to stay neutral because, you know, the West hates us and blames us. Um, and instead, it's more of a subtle kind of disillusionment and um, kind of feeling of sadness among many Chinese in China who want to do things like study abroad. Um, the U.S. has canceled many student visas um, out of suspicion, starting in the Trump administration, mm. especially that all Chinese students were spies. You know, thousands of people, hundreds, uh, lost their access. Um, uh, Trump also canceled the Fulbright uh, scholarship um, where Chinese and American scholars and professionals would go back and forth and um, try to understand each other. So it's, we do, I think what would be functional and healthy is to see anyone who is Chinese as an individual, not to kind of cast anyone with any sort of suspicion. And I think um, I was less pessimistic once the book was out, but since then, you know, there's been conversations I've had, there's been little things like the U.S. Justice Department basically canceling their China initiative, which over the last several years um, investigated scholars who were suspected of breaching national security, who may have aided China in economic espionage. Um, and a lot of studies have shown, a lot of surveys and analysis has shown that um, there may be bias in these prosecutions from the Justice Department, where over 90% of its targets were Chinese Americans. Um, and a lot of these cases ended up being thrown out because they weren't valid. Um, so, you know, the department did basically terminate this initiative. Um, so I think we're at a crossroads now where there is a chance to be a bit more thoughtful and careful about how we do talk about China and make policy in China to not just direct that at kind of an increasingly nationalistic, patriotic public, but to, with the aims of actually achieving um, aims, like achieving trying to make some sort of difference in what's happening in China, such as the crackdown on Muslims in Xinjiang, where about a million or more have been interned uh, in camps, re-education camps. Um, you know, having those human stories at the top of mind when we're talking about these things, instead of kind of letting kind of hubris and arrogance be at the forefront where the primary 
slight that China is posing is that it wants to depose U.S. as a world superpower. Um, but thinking about the people, uh, thinking about people in Hong Kong now who, um, if I had stayed there, I'd be living in basically another Chinese city after the imposition of the national security law, which makes so many things um, criminal that, you know, any sort of vague criticism of the Chinese government are, is criminalized. Um, so my book contains, you know, I don't really try to, like doing a podcast is just kind of my words, but the book really is this kind of um, collection of many people's stories, a lot of people who have direct experience of um, being targeted by the Chinese state, also um, being shunned and harassed uh, overseas. Um, so I, I, you know, I really want to tell their stories and almost, um, I'm, I use the techniques from narrative uh, journalism where I try to make their stories come alive, like their characters come alive so people can have greater empathy for the complexity mm -hmm. of you know all of these people's experiences. Because it is ordinary people, I think, who suffer in both cases with um, when governments are getting more strident and paranoid and insecure. Well, I will tell you that uh without being a master craftsman of the type of techniques, you did touch this heart. So congratulations. I think <laughs> you, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I, I ran a panel a few months ago with Orville Schell and Patrick Lawrence and uh, Jung Jung An from University of Michigan and some others. And Orville brought up uh, a, a publication in a, uh, called China Heritage, and a gentleman, I think his name was uh, like G Jeremy Barma, and there was mm -hmm, a yeah. tribute that Orville directed me to at the time, and when I was reading your book, I actually went back and read it, and it was, you know, various different things and quoting old Leonard Cohen songs. You're up in Canada. That's where Leonard's from Montreal. But uh, various mm -hmm. things. But there was a piece that he said at the outset, which I pulled up as I was reading your book. It was called The Invisible Republic of the Spirit. And it was a quote from a man named Stefan Zweig who was writing a biography of a man named Roman Roland who was talking about turmoil in Europe. But he was applying it and saying, essentially, we have to become members of the invisible republic of the spirit. And, and this is what Zweig wrote. The invisible republic of the spirit, the universal fatherhood, has been established among the races and among the nations. And you and I might change the gender words, but this is something written years ago. Uh, motherhood and fatherhood, brotherhood and sisterhood. Its frontiers are open to all who wish to dwell therein. Its only law is that of brotherhood. Its only enemies are hatred and arrogance between nations. Whoever makes his home within this visible, invisible realm becomes a citizen of the world. He is the heir, not of one people, but of all people. Henceforth, he is an indweller in all tongues and in all countries, in the universal past and the universal future. When I read your book, I would have nominated you for being his vice chairman of the Invisible Republic of the Spirit. I think that it just fit exactly with the tone and the spirit that I was gleaning from those pages. Because what I noticed was from every vantage point, you were very critical of evil as it harmed humans and you were very much an advocate for humans, whatever their nationality, whatever their birth origins, or what have you. And I think there's mm -hmm. something, uh, how would I say, there's been a lot of ways in which people criticize globalization because they act like everybody can, with you know electronics and fast money or whatever, nanoseconds, escape the state, and then the state doesn't have the resources to protect people. But there may be a unity from breaking down nations that the invisible republic of the spirit can be a prelude to. And I, and I do think uh, we're, we're seeing some team activity. You're, 
I thought your your uh, this is where I want to move toward here. Your discussion of Russia and China, where they have what looks like a surface formal collaboration between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, but underneath historically from philosophical, which you might call underpinnings in history, and some conflict, it's not quite so uh, obvious that there is a deep cultural mm -hmm. affiliation between the two yeah. countries. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the Russia and China discussion, I just want to kind of riff off what you said about, you know, less, you know, thinking about the world without borders. Um, I think there's a positive part of that, but then there's also the negative parts when it comes to what the Chinese state is doing, because we are basically whether we support that ideal or not, living in a place where borders matter less. Um, a lot of the research I found where people are uh, critics of China who are being targeted by Chinese police, um, mm -hmm. you know, Chinese security um, agents, um, they live all over the world. And they're people who are citizens, you know, they have passports of all sorts of countries where their rights of free speech should be protected. They're Australian citizens, Canadian, Americans. Um, and actually they've told me that um, members of Chinese embassy, Chinese police have either called them um, or in some cases even shown up on mm. their doorsteps um, around the world um, because they're unhappy with really small things like speaking out in solidarity with pro-democracy protesters mm -hmm. in Hong Kong back in 2019. And I think that ties into what we were talking about earlier about this really like um, one dimensional boogeyman kind of narratives on China. It's so distracting from what's actually happening because the stakes seem so high when you're talking about these really grand ideological battles it obscures actual workings of Chinese state power where I try to explain in the book why they are so concerned and worried about the opinions of ordinary low-level people where, um, you know, students um, are getting harassed by Chinese police um, incessantly when they have two Twitter followers and they, you know, they said something mildly critical or um, lower level politicians, people on the city council level uh, all over the world. There are case studies where when, you know, carrots don't work, when things like paid trips um, uh, to China, kind of being treated like a VAP doesn't work to kind of build that influence of low level politicians. Um, there's more kind of backhand ways where there's intimidation or um, photos of politicians um, who are unaware of these dynamics and risk are kind of twisted into propaganda serving the Chinese state um, or they're threatened. So by really looking at what's actually happening and acknowledging that you know borders don't really exist in some ways, um, we actually could actually understand what's actually happening with what Beijing is trying to do around the world and is doing and how it is trying to harass and intimidate its critics around the world. Um, I've spoken to many people who try to report what happened to them um, to local police um, in Canada, the US, and there's no structure around the world for how to deal with this because people don't expect that targets could be so lowly, could be students, could be people who aren't in major positions of power. Um, so we're unprepared. So that's, that's mm. one of the dimensions where really lofty, dramatic rhetoric can actually obscure research and actions taken to understand what China's, um, you know, their United Front Work Department, which I explain in the book, is trying to do. Um, and so, you know, nuance is not just because it's good, but it's because it's necessary because it's, we want to know what's actually happening and not what sounds mm -hmm. the most kind of like sexy and scary and exciting. Um, so talking about Russia and China now, I found that really interesting. Um, the book is actually in many ways a uh, collaboration between myself and local on the ground journalists, especially, uh, especially in the case of the Russia chapter. I wasn't able to go to Russia as planned because of the pandemic. Um, I worked with two really excellent Russian journalists um, who went all over, you know, in the mm. middle of winter <laughs> last, week, last year. 
um, talking to Russian stakeholders on the ground, like Russian businessmen, Russian um, who live in these places where there's a lot of economic partnerships and you know uh, huge growth in tourism between Russia and China, uh, such as in Siberia, um, where there's been things like protests against Chinese water bottling companies on the ground, um, you know, unbeknownst to many people who worry about that friendship between Putin and Xi Jinping, you know, they say that they're almost like brothers, they share ice cream cones together, they're, in, you know, before the current tensions were seated side by side, like eating sandwiches, things like that, like almost um, wholesome, like this, both of their states depiction of their relationship. Um, it kind of belies the actual tensions, the historical tensions you mentioned, like the Sino-Soviet split, uh, where because of diversions and how they wanted to apply um, the ideas of socialism, um, they were basically estranged, both countries. Um, Russia kind of seeing itself as they should be the big brother in the relationship, and China, you know, not, not taking that. The dynamics are very complicated to this day and China's growing um, ambition on a world stage as a world leader. They're, China's making kind of incursions into what Russia would consider its traditional sphere of influence in Central Asia, where China is you know, promoting its Belt and Road project, investment project with many countries um, in Central Asia, um, kind of stopping short of uh, military partnerships, which would rankle Russia. Um, but there is, you know, speaking with Russian experts and people who understand what's happening there, there is a growing um, distrust, both on the local, on the ground level, like people like not happy with um, how partnership agreements with China are going in Russia, as well as on top levels where they worry that um, an increasingly powerful China who is interested in the resources in Central Asia um, will end up not being an ally. Um, there's there's never been any serious developments of a Russia-China military alliance um, that doesn't exist. Um, some people argue that actually the most uh, consistent force putting both countries together is what they have in common, which is their increasing tensions and conflict with Western powers. Um, kind of pushing them together into this position where um, they should rely on each other economically, politically, because of their increasing um, dysfunctional um, relations with other major powers. Um, obviously, the war has only um, cemented this, especially on Russia's side, where China is its, its only viable major trade power, trade partner. Um, but it's kind of on shaky grounds because both countries are so different. The way they had historically applied socialism, so different. And their goals right now are different. Um, Russia wants to, it's definitely more expansionist, <laughs> as we've seen. Um, China, I, you know, analyze state documents, you know, speeches and its vision for a different world order isn't exactly a dramatic change. Um, China wants to adapt in existing international institutions to its benefit. Um, Xi Jinping has talked many times about how at the United Nations, um, countries with different um, governance styles, you know, he uses euphemisms, um, should be treated as equal. So regardless of your regime type, whether you have democracy or not, he wants these countries, you know, of course, China being not a democracy to have, you know, equal weight and equal respect. And that mm -hmm. if they basically crack down on the civil rights of their citizens, that shouldn't be a reason why they have less respect on the world stage. Um, and China has actually been making a lot of efforts. It has a seat on the United Nations Human Rights Council right now, making these kind of um, behind the scenes, not behind the scenes, but kind of not really showy efforts to have more influence at the UN, um, WHO, 
Um, they want these ex institutions to continue to exist. They just want them to be more sympathetic and supportive of China's uh, political system. Whereas Russia is like such a disruptor, a lot more brazen in many ways uh, than Beijing. So looking at how China's um, reaction to the war has been very muted, definitely not uh, supporting the invasion kind of isn't surprising to me because um, I kind of understand how that's not exactly the way a Beijing would like to operate to get more influence. It kind of wants to work um, within institutions as well as to use its economic clout uh, to get that power. Mm -hmm. So their visions are quite different. And in a way, perhaps China does have to have a hand because it's um, economic strength is that much higher. So whereas militarily, they're not mm -hmm. very strong. So it's more subtle uh, what Beijing is yeah, doing. Since they're, they're what you might call what makes them perhaps kindred spirits in some respect is you have what they call the century of humiliation from the opium wars mm -hmm. to the Japanese invasion and the loss of dignity in, at the level of Chinese leadership. The collapse of the Soviet Union was quite a mm -hmm. profound psychological scar. And so, mm -hmm. uh, which you might call rebalancing, regaining their strength and their dignity mm -hmm. in, a, in a system, yeah. uh, if it meets with too much, which you might call conformity imposed by the United States, it threatens that s sense of renewed mm -hmm. dignity. Uh, but I, I don't think they are kindred spirits across the spectrum. I think they have a, a similarity in one respect and a, a lot of differences. In, and as you mentioned, just a differences in the strategy of building the economy, mm -hmm. perhaps with regard to uh, the role of fossil fuels. They would be very different in this next phase with mm -hmm. Russia being one of the largest uh, owners of carbon producing energy and China mm -hmm. working very hard on renewables and uh, understanding the scope and scale of what's required for humankind to live. Let me ask you in that context of climate change, U.S. collaboration with China seems like a necessary condition for that to succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, it's interesting because when one of the anecdotes in the book, one of the you know chapters talked about how China hosted a meeting of the G20 um, in Hangzhou, um, and Xi Jinping really tried to take the stance where he was. I was watching him like addressing these world leaders, standing up, kind of almost smacking the podium, saying like, "We can't just be a talk shop. We need to take action on climate change," and. I think it's kind of a mix of strategy where climate is one of these issues where China can legitimately um, position and vie for leadership. And it's something that the world logically would want to encourage um, because China is where a lot of world manufacturing happens. Um, China's commitment to fighting climate change can make a big difference. Um, you know, China and the U.S. being the top carbon emitters. Um, the U.S. kind of sometimes tries to say, oh, there's more in China, but, you know, that's not very, um, you know, upfront about how a lot of that manufacturing in China is for American international mm -hmm. companies. Um, so, you know, people say, like, there's all of these things going on where you see this wolf warrior diplomacy going on from... China's foreign ministry, where the diplomats who used to, you know, act diplomatic uh, are now using platforms like Twitter to, you know, utter all sorts of kind of threats and really just kind of almost mirroring um, some of that really almost juvenile nationalism um, uh, against that they see in the States. Um, so, but, you know, in all of this, Chinese uh, counterparts are showing up to meetings, um, especially on things like climate, um, for the most part, 
uh, she didn't show up for for the latest um let me look this up actually before i say so what makes people worried you know up until um to this point you know chinese diplomats officials have showed up to all sorts of international summits um particularly you know seeming to take a genuine role in wanting to talk about how countries can work together to fight climate change. But there was a point um, you know, last year uh, in November when she did not show up to the COP26 climate conference. Um, instead of in attending in person, um, you know, giving a pre-recorded video address. Um, so there was discussion there, like even for climate, has have tensions reached a point where, you know, China is not showing up. Um, that is a you know one of the reasons why the idea that the U.S. and others could kind of fight China by isolating it is just not really realistic. Um, you know, for something so existential like um, trying to <laughs> prevent uh, the worsening of the climate crisis, there has to be. Uh, cooperation uh, internationally mm -hmm. with China. Um, there's kind of no way around it, you know. So, you know, she not showing up to climate summit, it was kind of lambasted by Biden and others. Um, she has not made any major climate change um, pledges. So that's something to continue to monitor whether the growing tensions uh, around China and other countries will continue to end up possibly affecting its um, pretty relatively friendly um, discussion so far on some issues uh, like climate. Um, part One of the themes of my book is that I've noticed that a lot of countries felt that they could have kind of more kind of tricky relations with China on one, some tracks, such as discussions on human rights, um, foreign interference, um, but then continue to have kind of friendly relations on other tracks, like on economics, on trade, on climate. Um, Canada found that when, at the height of anger about what happened with Huawei, Meng Wanzhou's arrest, you know, that stalled. Like China um, put tariffs on Canadian goods like pork and canola, that kind of separate tracks um, thinking um, kind of ended up, you know, cracking. Um, so that was a shock to many people. So we'll have to see how, what, what do you think as an economist, like can economic relations be, and conversations on things that aren't, aren't political, like climate change on the most part, be shielded from these increasing political tensions? I guess I would say if the political tensions weren't there, it would be easier. But I think perhaps mm -hmm. knowing that the end game could be the extermination of humankind creates a compelling uh, force in the other direction. Yeah. But let's let's take an area that's not considered uh, which you might call fatal. The development of Africa. We can see China putting a lot of energy into building roads and engaging their Americans being quite concerned. Technological platforms. Uh, well, I guess to start with, the African continent by, by the uh, projections of the International Office of Migration will house 5 billion people by 2075. With climate change and being an equatorial region, subsistence farming will not be as available. You have 5 billion people. The world, as I'm sure you're sensitive to, has been quite difficult about what you might call um, digesting large-scale migration. East Asian development model, manufacturing, learning by doing, a little bit of tariffs and then export is harder to do with global supply chains and automation. So people are very concerned about an African development strategy that coheres but the Chinese appear to be, what you might call, reaching out to build platforms and build structures, ports, highways, uh, various facilities that contribute to that. It's a, it reminds me a little bit of your chapter on Greece, where mm -hmm. with the resources they come and uh, you'll collaborate because 
they're contributing to a better life. INET did a conference in 2018 at Beijing University with Justin Lin, and uh, many African leading economists and thinkers from Ethiopia, from, all, from many, many different places, attended enthusiastically. They were very curious. So I, I guess I'm asking because people from India, people from the United States, and some people from Europe seem very skeptical. How do you see what's happening with China and Africa? Yeah, what what so. some would say cynically is it's just an attempt to grab natural resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Belt and Road is a major focus in my book because, like I mentioned, China has a lot of you know, tools at its disposal to increase its international influence that aren't mm -hmm. militaristic. Uh, they have, you know, their, you know, relatively strong economy. They have um, the funds to invest all over the world. And it's, I think what's missed is that a lot of this funding for investment and trade infrastructure is, isn't just kind of like a play for influence. It's not we will help build roads and um, ports and in exchange we get support at the UN. We get um, people uh, like Greece after um, China's uh, state-owned company did take over its major port in Athens. Uh, Greece did um, use its votes in the UN to stand with Beijing 2016 and 2017, um, you know, vetoing high-profile criticisms of human rights in China. Um, but it's not the, um, you know, the story that China's doing this primarily and completely just for this kind of um, political support and influence. Uh, China's uh, state-owned industries are struggling because they're so huge and so inefficient. Um, they need more markets. They need more projects <laughs> uh, for them to work on. Um, and China needs to have, you know, robust trade routes. It wants to open up trade um, all around the world, especially with tensions with major Western powers. It wants to increase it and improve the trade infrastructure of smaller, you know, more economically weaker countries because then they could trade with China um, or China's shipping companies have that security of having those trade routes open, um, like in the Mediterranean. Um, so it's not just um, they're doing this to just for purely for um, political power. Um, and it, this is actually, you know, their investments in Africa have predated this idea of the Belt and Road Project, which is so important. It's now, it's been written into China's constitution. Um, you know, some say what happened in Africa um, should kind of, you know, tell the future of how these newer investments in different places um, will pan out. Um, in some parts of Africa, there's people who have been angry about how some of these projects worked out, where there were promises of, or expectations that, you know, African labor um, would be utilized, but in fact, many of these Chinese state companies brought in Chinese workers. Um, so a lot of the benefits um, that criticism went didn't really apply to local African economies. Um, more criticisms is that in exchange for building, um, improving an airport or a highway that will disintegrate and, you know, need repairs and um, in the future, um, China getting in exchange access to natural resources, like things like um, rare minerals, um, farmland, you know, those are finite resources in Africa that they're giving up. Um, but it is really complicated because um, it's, I wouldn't characterize it, and I do reject the idea that this is colonialism um, because there's a lot of um, proactiveness on different sides of all of these different partnerships under China's kind of international uh, investment uh, umbrella. Um, it's more, I think in many cases, including with the idea of foreign interference, where China's, uh, you know, police forces are uh, intim intimidating local people or trying to co-op local politicians in our world. A lot of the missing puzzle piece is 
what you can do to be smarter about this um, is to have that understanding of other countries' experiences, um, what um, China's motivations are, how it benefits from different deals, um, so that you're going into these negotiations um, with more information, rather than, you know, in my research, um, places that have kind of are in a position where they're more desperate, where they may have been burned by some of the austerity measures that the EU, um, you know, World Bank might impose for in exchange for loans, um, like in Greece, Greece's case, where they turn to China and, you know, local media and politicians um, kind of put China, China on the platform where they're almost a savior. Um, in Italy, I kind of traced Xi Jinping's um, 2019 tour of the country, mm -hmm. um, where in the wake of his tour, Italian media would just point to random projects like this factory that's going under, this port all over Italy, all these ports, um, they could be you know, taken over by Chinese investment. Um, and that was a positive thing because Italy's you know, debt was soaring. Um, but a lot of, I spoke to the mayor of Palermo, he said, there's no, there's nothing about, um, they've actually had no conversations with China about, you know, turning over its port. It was a lot of hot air. Mm. Um, so I think it's important for, <laughs> to point out when, um, if there's a reverse, when China is not kind of this boogeyman, but China is almost this very, very positive savior of struggling economies. I mean, that's not healthy either. In the, uh, I guess since we're coming down the home stretch here, you're, you're seeing a lot of things. You've called out a lot of untruths. Uh, I want to start with inside China. A lot of people show you statistics of significant improvement. You would think the need for authoritarian control would be diminished because people would be celebrating the success of economic development. Uh, I saw a movie recently by a woman named Jessica Kingdon called Ascension. It was nominated as a documentary uh, in the Oscars this year. And it characterized a slightly different sense of there, that there is, if you will, a plutocracy forming inside China and a large part of the population is employed in servitude. I didn't know if this was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how would I say, I, I, anecdotally she can produce some elements of that, but whether that's a, a vivid portrait of a hierarchical society that's very controlled vertically or whether it's an exception where the broader base prosperity is much, uh, much greater. But what do you see? What do you think? People are worried about real estate overhangs and so forth. What do you see as the next few years inside China, and is the well-being, material well-being, psychological well-being, on a on a constructive course, or is it in in jeopardy? I think China partly. Um to explain how insecure it behaves on the political world stage. A lot of it can be explained by the pressures it faces internally. Um, things that are really basic, like its population mm -hmm. crisis, where it's, it's had its one-child policy and then a two-child policy um, to try to control births. Um, uh, as a result, you know, they have a rapidly aging population and, you know, few births. Like even after Chinese, uh, you know, lawmakers relax, um, the one child policy, people didn't want to have more than one child because life was so hard for parents, um, even just raising one child. Um, it's really ironic because if you visited, lived in a place like Beijing or Shanghai or Hong Kong, like that, it seems like you wouldn't guess it's a socialist country. It seems like mm -hmm. it's capitalism <laughs> on steroids and it's all of this <laughs> pursuit of wealth and just real estate just going through the roofs with no seemingly very little c control. When I lived in Beijing, I had to move almost every year, sometimes less than every year because just my rent kept getting hiked. 
um, very little, it's not like in Canada where you can only raise rent by 2%, like it would go up by mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> um, and very expensive. And it's hard for someone to have more than one child because it's such a competitive society. There's only so many universities trying to just provide for that child to possibly succeed and you know get that university spot. It's just, you know, parents have to go f just back breaking days in whatever fields they're doing um, to try to do that. So China's really facing um, increasing difficulties because it's become a place that's so unequal where there are shrinking opportunities, um, you know, for people to feel like they can climb up the ladder, um, you know, improve their family situations. Um, so an idea like you referred to was that, you know, in exchange for economic prosperity and stability, um, the Chinese people generally support the status quo, where, well, there's, you know, there's still, you know, throughout the year, dozens of labor protests all over China, factory workers, disgruntled um, workers, um, people looking for their pensions that happen that don't, don't really get a lot of media coverage. So there's these tensions kind of shaking Chinese society. And I think things like basic mental health have gotten a lot worse under the COVID zero uh, policies of China, where they're, basically their borders have been closed pretty um, strictly. Um, that, of course, has impacted businesses that rely on kind of international exchanges. Uh, a lot of um, world uh, multinational companies have left China or their employees have left. Um, so it's kind of in a place where I think these COVID has only exacerbated some of the internal um, tensions and pressures um, and made people all the more starting to be more and more critical of how, you know, their government has been handling things. So unfortunately, anytime there's kind of pushback, um, you know, Xi Jinping, China's current leadership, instead of kind of having that space for more public feedback um, and, you know, government response, there's been more crackdowns, there's been new laws, um, more people arrested, more journalists arrested. Like I have friends like, uh, Sophia Huang, a journalist um, in southern China who was on her way to study in the UK, um, someone who was, you know, I guess her crime was to be quite supportive of women um, who were suffered from sexual harassment. You know, she's been arrested since September. So I think it's not a very kind of positive trajectory where there's more and more reason for some internal um, dissatisfaction. Um, but again, there's increasing uh, kind of crackdowns as, as a result. Um, definitely COVID has added to those tensions. Um, on the most part, I think it is a, a place where a lot of people aren't really daring to speak up. So it's hard to get a sense of um, people's, how far they might be willing to go to kind of express their dissatisfaction. Um, I think for the most part, people who are pr pragmatic, even people who have been outspoken in the past as activists or intellectuals, they're kind of staying quiet. They're electing to stay quiet, but it's unsure if there could be some sort of breaking point where some of these kind of voices that have fallen silent um, might be more active again. Um, it's, you know, I think the near term future, I find like there's just a lot of nervousness. There's nervousness from within China, but what will happen also um, China's relation with other countries, whether it will, you know, be increasingly aggressive towards its claims on Taiwan and South China Sea. Uh, right now, it's like a time of tensions and uncertainty and, and worry that some sort of sparking incident will make things worse, might lead to war, might lead to, you know, some sort of tragedy that people don't want to see. Um, so, but, you know, to end on a more positive note, when all of the younger people I've met in China, they're so, on the most part, so not ideologically driven. They don't have those kind of mm -hmm. historical traumas that I think the current crop of Chinese leaders have experienced, such as during the Cultural Revolution, you know, work, you know, anger at the West for the century of humiliation by col colonial powers. You know, young people today, they don't have that kind of trauma, I think. Um, I try to provide that historical snapshot of what China was like in the 60s and 70s. 
um, because I think it does inform just this overreactions that we see from the Chinese state. But young people, they haven't had those direct experiences of feeling so aggrieved and so worried about any kind of turmoil or you know, um, disagreement in their own society. Mm. So I think eventually um, they will be China's next leaders. So I do feel optimistic in perhaps like the, the 20 year mark into the future, but people worry about what might happen until then. Last thought for today. If I called you tomorrow and we had an invitation to visit the White House, what five things would you tell President Biden he should do to make the world a better place in light of your writing and the tensions that we see in the world now? Yeah. Um, I think you know, I have had the opportunity to, you know, provide feedback to different government bodies since the book was out. And, you know, something I say is that just make use of your intellectual capital, the, your knowledge um, capital in that you already have um, to address, you know, these gaps in your understanding. You know, American experts of Chinese descent should be seen as Americans and not stereotyped according to their ethnic background and pushed out of these, you know, policy making circles. Um, there should be an infusion of federal funding to support Chinese language and China studies programs in your universities. So you foster this kind of um, knowledge gathering of the future policymakers. You should bring back the Fulbright program of educational exchanges between American and Chinese students, professionals, and researchers, and reinstate visas so that um, you can, you know, make use of the Chinese expertise. Um, that's and treating them as individuals and not as some sort of um, just counterpart of the Chinese state is important um, because you know the more inclusive. American and other institutions become where we're addressing our kind of deep-seated racism and xenophobia and that's where we can get people with their life experiences and expertise in China into the rooms um, to make better policies to actually explain what is happening um, instead of having these very almost cartoonishly hawkish views dominate um, more people will be empowered to challenge them with nuance and with their real understanding. Well, Joanna, you're an extraordinary beacon. I want to emphasize to my young scholars that not only do you have imagination and insight, ability to express things, but you have an extraordinary endowment of courage to live as an Asian woman between the U.S. and China, reporting on all these things so vividly so courageously is extraordinary.